is that a lot of us, myself included, has something from our childhood that was traumatic, and we, we didn't know how to process that. And so as a result, while you're, you're an adult now and you're trying to figure stuff out and you're trying to have normal relationships with people, healthy relationships, and you struggle to do that because you never, you never took care of it. And, and, and who's to blame us? Because when, when we're a little kid, I mean, nobody told me how to deal with the crap that happened in my life. They, they never did. You know, like I can remember when I was, um, I don't know how old I was, but I remember when my grandpa died. Um, and uh, I, I was probably six or seven years old, something like that. I'd never been to a funeral before. And I remember being at the funeral, it was at the funeral home just over in Northeast, in Northeast, the one just past the bridge. You know, you go into Northeast, it was on the right side. I don't know if it's still there. But anyways, I remember being a little kid, just being there and seeing my grandpa's dead body in the casket. And I was just freaked out. I was terrified. I was like, why is he not waking up? I was like, where, where is he? And they were trying to explain to me that he died. And I was just, it messed me up. Still to this day, I'm just a little freaked out about it. You know, I'm just like, I don't, I mean, I, I don't think we do well dealing with stuff like that. Um, because there's no, there's no handbook on how to, how to process through your emotions, especially when you're five years old and something terrible happens to you, right? You're, we're not supposed, God did not create us to go through traumatic experiences as small children. Like we're supposed to have healthy boundaries and, and grow up in a, a healthy family. And, and that's what God wants for all of us. But unfortunately, this room's filled with people who have not that experience. We've had the opposite experience. So let me talk about some stuff that happens to kids as they grow up. These, these are just some things I wrote down. Uh, these are things that if it happened to you as a kid, then it probably caused some trauma in your life. One is like your pet dying. Um, now, I'm not a big pet guy, so when my pets died, I didn't, especially if they were cats, I'm like, you know, I would get, you know, whatever. But, but I know kids, like my kids, my daughters, like we have cats now, and, and uh, when the time comes for them to be gone, however that looks like, they're going to be traumatized because they really love those cats. And I, I understand that, but it's just... Now, I mean, to me, they're just animals that can be easily replaced. I don't, I don't know. That's how I, But for a lot of kids, it's, it's when a loved one died. You know, like for me, you know, when my, my grandfather died. So when you're a small child and somebody dies, it's hard to process through those things. Another thing is maybe you've witnessed uh, an event. Maybe you witnessed a traumatic event growing up. Uh, like, like there are kids who witness, um, you know, people dying. Like, you know what I mean? And like there, I know people who, I don't know if there's anyone that goes to our church, but I know, I know some people who uh, their father hung himself and, and the kid walked in and found him. You don't think that jacks up a kid for the rest of their life? It does. It has a long-term effect. Um, sometimes, and this is probably the biggest one, is, is whenever kids are physically abused or sexually abused at, at a young age, especially by uh, a father or an uncle or, you know, some, someone that should be trusted. Um, if, I, if, if, if you knew the real statistic on how many kids have been, uh, you'd, you'd be blown away at how, how often that goes on in our society. Um, here's another thing. Uh, so other people become traumatized be, because they're neglected by their parents. You know what I mean? Like there's a lot of parents just doing their thing. And the, ki the kids just happen to be there, and so they don't really pay any attention to them. They neglect them. It's, it's really sad. Um, or it, it could be that you got bullied as a kid for whatever reason. Or it could be that your parents got a divorce when you were really young, and you didn't know how to deal with that, and maybe you even blamed yourself a little bit. That tends to happen, too. And this could go on and on and on. We talk about all, all the different things. But the, the bottom line is that kids deserve, okay, those of us that are raising kids, our kids deserve a, a healthy, to grow up in a healthy family where they're not exposed to. Now, we can't control every situation, but I'm, I promise you, like, I, you know, I've, I've told you before, I'll have a prison ministry if that's what it comes down to, because I'm going to protect my daughters and make sure that they don't experience any traumatizing events if I can help it. And I, you know, you know what I'm saying? Like, I know you say, well, the Bible says not to be violent, but, but I'm going to protect my daughters at all costs and my sons, okay? So 
So I'm just, I'm just telling you that that's our job as parents. That's what we're supposed to do. And I'm blown away at how little that happens in our society and how much of that goes on and people just look the other way and, and somebody gets off with probation. I told you that, about that before. I, I'm a big proponent of the death penalty for stuff like that. I just don't care, you know, because it, it, it would be becoming a, a deterrent. So let me, I want to show you this. Uh, if you're on Facebook or Instagram, you may have seen this. Um, but I, I came across this letter uh, a couple weeks ago, a friend of mine posted it, and, and what it is, it's a, it's a letter from a little girl who's in the foster care system, and I don't know, I, I'm assuming it's a little girl, they didn't say, but is, I'm assuming it's a girl, and, and she's real small, and, and it's just a wish list letter that she has for hopefully one day when she finds a family, um, and so go ahead and put it, I want to read this to you. So this is, her, this is her letter that she wants, it's just what she wants out of a family. It says, things I want in my family says, um, I want food and water, okay? That's, and what I want you to understand about this is I don't know this little girl, I've never met her, but everything she talks about in here, she says for a reason, right? Because evidently she's been in situations where she didn't have these things. And uh, I'll try to keep it together while I read this because it's, uh, it's pretty emotional. But it says, she goes, I want, I want food and water. She goes, don't hit on me, Right? So she's evidently been in a situation, in an environment where her parents hit her or some adult has hit her and abused her. Um, it says, she goes, I want a house with running water and lights. I mean, it's, it's so crazy. I think how much we take for granted in our own lives. She says, I want love. Right? None of these things are outrageous. It's something that every kid deserves and should have. She says, I want love. Um, mom and dad don't fight. She doesn't want her parents to fight. She goes, I want no drugs, no drugs in the house. I, don't, don't kill my pets. Don't, I mean, think about that. She's, she wrote that down because that has happened to her. Somebody has killed her pets in the past. I mean, it's not too much to ask that you just don't kill my pets. She says, I want help with school, um, nice, clean clothes, no lice, no bug in the house, in house. Um, says, clean house clean bed with covers, you know, she, she, she evidently didn't even have a clean bed with covers and it was, had lice all over it, um, don't sell my toys, treated it fair, I mean, think about that, like someone killed her animals, her pets, and they sold her toys, I mean, this little kid has gone through some trauma, so she goes, I just want to be treated fair, uh, don't get drunk, TV in the house, she goes, I just want TV in the house, let me keep my games, school stuff, Nice shoes, my own comb, soap, nice house, and a safe, uh, a nice house and safe, um, AC and heater. She wants an air conditioner and a heater and a toothbrush. I mean, this kid, like, she, she goes, I just, I just want a toothbrush. She, I just want my own comb that doesn't have lice in it. You understand, you understand what this kid is going through? It, it blows me away. That this is a real letter from a kid. And, and, and then there's people in our church that could write a letter just like that when you were a kid. Because some of you guys went through environments just like this. And I show this to you, not, not to tug at your heartstrings and cause you to cry or whatever. I mean, I'm getting pretty emotional because I, I just think about all the... This is not an isolated incident. There are tons of kids in our society that have that as their experience growing up. And what I want you to understand is that when, when you grow up like that... You don't think this kid is going to have long-term effects in their life? You think this kid is going to be well-adjusted in society? Now, hopefully, the hope is that this little kid gets adopted by a, a good Christian family, and they take care of her, and they teach her right and wrong. You know what I'm saying? And they provide for her. Now, but even if that happens, I promise you, because I don't know how old that kid is, but let's just say she's five years old. Do you remember anything from when you were five? I do. I remember some traumatizing stuff that happened to me when I was five years old. I do. And, and I still find it affecting me today. And so this kid is going to be, like, they're behind the eight ball as far as life goes. And so it, it's just all too common. And so we've got to figure out how to put an end to this stuff. And some of you guys are dealing with that very thing, like that you had something as a child in your childhood, and it has been working its way out in your life as an adult. And so we've got to figure out how to, how to deal with that. Like, what do we do with that? Um, so let me, let me talk about that for a second. I, I, I want to tell you about the, a friend of mine. So one of my really good friends uh, is Sean Sears. He pastors a church in, in Boston. And some of you guys may be familiar with him. 
but his dad is Ron Sears, and, and Ron and I are really good friends too, and uh, he's been a good mentor for me, for me through the years. And um, so, so Ron's like, like, like I'm his son's age, right? So uh, in 2003, Ron wrote a book called Diamonds Are Forever. I actually have a copy in my office, I think, and, uh, and we can order more if any of, any of you guys would like a copy of it. But it's a really good book, and it, it's a book about his, his wife. So Ron was a pastor for his whole adult life, right? And so he, was, he got married to Marilyn probably, I mean, they were probably 18, 19 years old. They were really young. And they've got a great relationship. They're still together. I mean, everything is great in their life. But everything wasn't always great. Like, they just, he just, they recounted that through the years, like, she just felt kind of closed off to him. You know what I'm talking about? Like, like, like she struggled with intimacy. And I don't mean sexually, but I, I mean just intimacy, um, letting someone part of their life. And so when they got down to it, they finally got some counseling, and they finally drug it out of her that she had been molested her Growing up, her father had, had sexually abused her growing up, her whole childhood. Now, the thing about it was, is her dad was a deacon in the church. Every Sunday was a deacon in the church. And so she didn't know who she could tell. Like, she just kept that to herself. And it really messed her up on the inside, just like all of it was would. And so when, whenever she finally got all it, whenever they wrote the book, it was, she was in her mid-50s, you know? And that happened as, a, so that happened 50 years ago. And, and you would think that even with counseling, that it would be gone and she would be fixed, but she's not. Even still to this day, she's in her 60s and still struggles with some of those memories because it was her dad and because it should have never happened. And, and it's just, it just creates all kinds of messed up scenarios in our life. And, and, you know, we always say time heals all wounds, but that's not true. Time will heal your physical wounds. It can but some of the emotional scars that you guys have been carrying through life, time does not heal those. You may repress them. You may suppress them for a while, but eventually they're going to come out. And so we've got to learn to, to deal with these things in a healthy way. So, um, so let's talk about that. How do we deal with it? How do we deal with our junk? Okay. Um, so just to kind of lighten the mood a little bit, uh, I, I've got some funny, some memes from, from the internet. Because, because what do we do? Before, hold on, go back, go back, go back. You got, you got to follow with me. So, because what, how we deal with our junk, right? We put on a mask. Uh, or, and then another way that we do that is like through in, um, uh, Instagram filters. There's people that go to our church that I'm Facebook friends with or Instagram. And I don't really, uh, you know, the, or not you guys, but there's people I'm Facebook friends with that I don't really know what they look like. You know what I mean? Because every time they post a picture, it's always got a filter and it doesn't look like them. You look 20 years younger or whatever, and it's fine, but, but at some point, you got, but you can't, you can't put on filters on your regular life, and that's all I want to show you. Go to the next one. You saw this one. This was Yoda. This is, this is Yoda's filter. He looks much, much, much younger. Um, go to the next one. There's Freddy Krueger. That's his Instagram filter. Looks like a normal guy. That's, uh, what is it, Gollum? Yeah, Mr. Smeagles or something. Some of you will get this, some won't. That's uh, no filter, and that's with a filter right there. Uh, <laughs> anyway, go to the next one. This is the last one. Uh, this is before Instagram. This is after Instagram. That, but that's what we do with our life. That's, you know, our life's falling apart, but we put an Instagram filter up and make everything look good when it's really not. So let me get, I, I sat down and wrote some things. I want to show you. This is how... In a, in a negative way, we deal with our emotions and the pain and the junk from our past. So some people, I just call them, the, there's the stuffer. They, they stuff things down. They suppress things. You know what I mean? Like something happened to you as a child or even as an adult. And, and for, you know, for some people, it's getting, going through a divorce yourself and not really knowing how to process that. So you just stuff all your feelings down. And, but you know what happens when you stuff them down? You, you kind of explode on people. Like, it, it doesn't happen often, but you'll be, you know, arguing with your spouse or, your, you know, your coworkers are driving you nuts, and you'll just explode, and you'll say some stuff that came out of nowhere. You're like, I don't know where that came from. What well, came from way down in here? Because you've been stuffing it down, and that's not the healthy way to do things. Then there's the eater. Some of you guys eat your problems. You eat your feelings. You know, you know what I'm talking about. When, whenever you start to have these emotions and stuff. You go to the freezer, you get the whole gallon of ice cream out, and you eat the whole thing. 
And yeah, that's what you do. You're the, you're the eater. Um, some people are the drinker or the user, so they just go get drunk. They're, they're dealing with all this stuff. I don't know how to deal with it. And so you just go drink, and they go use. And, and what those things do is they medicate the pain. They, they, so we self-medicate, but what you find out is that it just, it just numbs the pain, but it's still there. So when you wake up tomorrow and you're hungover, or if you're, you're getting high, you're going to wake up five days from now someplace where you don't know where you're at or in jail, and now you got more problems. But the problems that you started trying to evade are still there. And so now you got to deal with more problems than what you had before. Then there's the self-loather. There's people who just blame themselves for everything. Then there's the, the people who are bitter. There's people who are... Um, just, just bitter towards other people. There's people that are bitter towards God because why did this happen to me? Um, it's not my fault. God, it's God's fault. God could have prevented it, and they're just mad at the world. There's people who want revenge, and those are, those are dangerous people. And then there's people who hurt others. Like we always say, hurt people, hurt people. Hurting people will hurt other people. That, I, I see that all the time. I, I tell you guys about regularly when someone lashes out at me for no reason i'm like now i know they're i'm not their problem they're they're mad they're upset about something somebody else did and they're just taking it out it's the, the old thing you get mad at your boss and you go home and kick the dog thing right Pe that happens to people all the time and so we we hurt other people and so um uh, the last thing another thing that we do is isolate so what happens is a lot of people don't know how to deal with all of that and so they'll drink or they'll do drugs or they'll eat or they'll you know, any number of things. But one of the worst things you can do is just isolate. And, and instead of putting on a mask and coming to church and just saying, I'm fine, you just don't show up. And you just kind of disappear for a while and, and you isolate away from everybody else. And that only makes things worse because God did not create any of us to go through life that way on our own. He wants us to do life together. And so we've got to be able to be honest with one another. So as we think about that. As I was preparing this message, I was trying to find some biblical examples. And I have a couple. Well, first one, the first one we're not going to turn to. I just want to tell it to you, and you can go back and read it. But it's the story of Job. And most of you guys are familiar with the story of Job and how that went down. So in the book of Job, um, jo Job was uh, probably the wealthy, wealthiest person in, in the land at that time, right? He was like the richest guy. He had everything. He had all this money and stuff and he had 10 kids. And so the Bible says one day, because Satan, you know, created a scenario, he wanted to test Job. So, so um, Satan took everything from him on one, in one day. So in one day, he lost all of his livestock, he lost all of his money, his house burned down, and all of his kids died in one day. That all just happened in one day. And, and Job and his wife were devastated because everything was taken from him except for his wife. And, uh, and she wasn't uh, she wasn't taking it very well. And I've told you guys before, uh, I kind of cut her some slack because she lost everything too. You know, it wasn't just Job. Those were her children too. And so she was devastated. All my 10 kids are, are dead and everything we have. I mean, the stuff you can replace, the money, you can get more money, but, but the kids are a different story. So she was devastated. And, and the, the, the thing that sticks out to me about that is that the way Job handled that and the way his wife handled that. She didn't handle it well, and Job was like, Job was like, well, God gave us everything. If he wants to take it away, that's his business, okay? We came into the world naked. We're going to leave naked. Uh, I'm going to give glory to God no matter what happens, and that is the right response. That's the only right response because he could have just went and got drunk, or he could have just been mad at God, or he could have just said, you know, I, I don't like what's going on, but I have to just accept it, right? Acceptance is a huge thing, but his wife didn't. His wife told him, she goes, why don't you just curse God and die? What she was saying, the way I take that, is she was basically saying, you know, that, that's a form of suicide. You know how some people die by death, by, by co suicide by cops? You know, people do that. They, they don't have the guts to pull the trigger themselves, so they'll go have a cop do it for some reason. I mean, people do that all the time. And so that's, that was her plan. She just thought, if we curse God, maybe God will kill us and we'll just end it all. And... Just digging into that a little bit and thinking through that, I, I kind of understand where she's coming from. I mean, I've talked about this before. I feel like we've all been there a little bit at times where we're just like, you know what? For me, for me, I know I'm going to heaven when I die. So if today's my last day, if I drop dead of a heart attack right now, it's the, it's the best is yet to come. Like, that's when it's really going to get great. This, this world, this earth 
is a, it's a hassle, man. It's a chore waking up every day and doing the right thing. Life is hard. Heaven is going to be awesome. I've had thoughts before where I'm just like, I can't wait for that day. And I've never, I don't really consider suicide ever. That's not part of my, my, my DNA. It's not part of my makeup. But I've had thoughts before. I'm like, come on, God, let's just get it over with. Let's, you know what I'm saying? Like, life is hard right now. Or, you know, I'd like to see my dad again. I'd like to see my grandpa again. There's people, Ron, I, I want to see Ron again. Ron David, I, you know, so you think about stuff like that, but I want you to understand that God leaves us here for a reason. There's a reason why God has me here and has you here. That's waiting. Everything I just talked about, if you're a Christian, that's waiting for us. So let's not shortcut God's plan for our life. But yes, in the interim, while we're here, yeah, we're going to have to go through a lot of crap. We're going to have to deal with a lot of EGR people, extra grace required. We just are, but, but God gives us the grace. If we do it with God, we can do it gracefully, this life. That's what I'm telling you. So let's, let's think about that. So the way Job handled it and the way his wife were two different ways, and, of course, that all worked out in the end in that story. The other story is, I love this story in John chapter 11. If you have a Bible, I want you to turn there because I want you to highlight some Even if it's in your notes, I want you to highlight it so you can go back and talk and look at it and read that later and process through that. So in John chapter 11, verse 32 is where we're going to start. But let me set it up for you. Okay, it's the story of Lazarus. So there was a, a guy named Lazarus who died. But before that happened, Lazarus had two sisters. Anybody for 100 points who knows who his two sisters were? Yeah, Mary and Martha. So what it is, when you read the scriptures in the New Testament, you see that Mary and Martha and Lazarus were really good friends with Jesus. So they lived in a small town called Bethany. And so whenever Jesus was in that area preaching, he would go to their house and he would actually sleep at their house. They would put him up in a guest bedroom. So they got to be really, really close. Well, one day Jesus was teaching and doing some ministry a couple of towns over and somebody sent word to him and said, hey, your friend Lazarus is really sick and he's about to die. If you don't come right now, he's going to die. And so G the Bible makes a point because Jesus said that, that, that Jesus goes, we're going to wait here two more days. So he waited in that town two more days and then they got word that Lazarus had died. And, and, Jesus, and his disciples were like, why didn't we go before? And, and Jesus had a plan. And so he goes, well, we're going to go. And they're like, he's already dead. What's the point? And he goes, he's just asleep. And they go, well, if he's asleep, then we'll just wake him up. And Jesus goes, you, you guys are idiots. Okay, he's dead, but I'm going to bring him back. He didn't call them idiots, but you know he wanted to. So, so his friend Lazarus died, right? A lot of you guys know that story. And so when Jesus comes into town, this is where the story picks up. Actually, before we get to this, what happened before that was Martha, the other sister, she met Jesus first, and she went out, and she grabbed on, onto Jesus, and she said, if you were here, my brother wouldn't have died. And she's crying, and she's upset, and she wasn't accusing Jesus of anything. She was just acknowledging, you could have saved my brother if you were here. And, she, and she's upset, okay? Well, I just want you to understand the pain and the hurt that's going on here. And she goes, she goes you could have saved my brother if you were here. She goes, but I trust you. I know everything's going to be okay. And that was the proper response. So Jesus comes into town. This is where it picks up in verse 32. It says, when Mary arrived and saw Jesus, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had only been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and saw the other people wailing with her, uh, a deep anger welled up within him, and he was deeply troubled. Now, I just want you to take note of these descriptions uh, of Jesus. It says he was deeply troubled. Verse 34, where have you put him? He asked them. They told him, Lord, come and see. Then Jesus wept. Okay, another, that, that's in some, most versions, just two words, and that's the shortest verse in the Bible, in case, like, if you're at the pearly gates, and it's on the entry exam, it's, what's the shortest verse in the Bible? It's that, Jesus wept, sorry, so just so you know, but, but, so let's just take this from it, because Jesus went and healed Lazarus, he had been dead four days, and he stunk, but Jesus, Jesus healed, brought him back to life, okay, now, let me, let me take you and give you some context, okay, so, I don't know how much you know about Martha and Mary, but earlier in this passage and in another passage that talks about the same event, it tells us that Mary is the same one who broke open the alabaster box at Jesus' feet. So what that was, the alabaster box was 
this beautiful, it was a beautiful thing that a, a dad would save up a whole year's wages and go buy this expensive perfume. It, it took a year's worth of wages. And he would present that to his daughter when she was really young. Now, what she was supposed to do was to save that for her wedding night. And on her wedding night, she was supposed to be a virgin. And it was, it was her, a, a, a signification of her, she would break it open on her husband's feet and, and in other words, saying, I've saved myself. I've been pure for you all these years, and, and, and now you're my husband. And she would break it out, and that would, it would be a beautiful ceremony. Well, Mary, the Bible tells us that, that's, that Mary and Martha, that that's the same Mary that did that. But what we also know about her is pre- previous to the alabaster box incident was that she, was, she had seven demons, right? It says that she was demon-possessed and that she was a prostitute. So she, so so the whole alabaster box thing. She wasn't a virgin. She wasn't going to be a virgin on her wedding night, but she still had that alabaster box. So sometime previously in her history, she became demon possessed. The Bible specifically says she had seven demons that Jesus cast out of her. But she was also a woman of the night. So she was selling her body for for her, selling sex for money. That's what she did. But. I kind of feel like it's because she was demon-possessed because when she met Jesus, he healed her, he cast the demons out, and he completely set her free. But how many of you guys know that didn't just fix her life? She wasn't just fixed overnight. She's got a lot of junk from her past. She's got a lot of baggage. So I just want you to understand that people like that with trauma in their life, so now she had all of that to deal with, and then her brother dies, Right, So I just want you to understand, people like, like, and I'll put myself in that category, people like me who have had trauma in my life, when I experience something like the death of a close friend or, something, or a relative, I don't always handle it great. You know what I'm talking about? Like, so we, we don't always know how to handle things in a healthy way. And that, that's why people will go get drunk, people will go start using drugs. They'll do any number of things just to deaden the pain because we're not equipped on how to handle that so mary had a lot of baggage from her past and now her brother dies and so she just goes and she just pours out her heart to jesus and she's really upset and i just loved how jesus just ministered to her there and then he actually brought lazarus back from the dead and and mary is a great case study on someone who's got a lot of trauma in her life but had a relationship with god so the other uh we'll we'll get to the other one in a minute let me let me give you my third thought on what we're talking about is we need to find healthy ways to deal with our pain and our hurt, okay? We, we, we got to, because we're not good at it. Like I told you, we're, we're not, by nature, I'm not good at handling the, the trauma that's in my life. In fact, I want to show you this. I think Jeff uh, Danforth showed me this meme a while back. Some of you guys have seen this. Look at what it says. It says, if you don't heal from what hurt you, you'll bleed on people that didn't cut you. Just, just, I just want you to read that again and just think about it. And, and I'll post this on Facebook later today. Maybe you want to re- you know, share it because it's, it's such a powerful thought. If you don't heal from what hurt you, you'll bleed on people that didn't cut you. And that's what's happening right now. Like there's so many of you guys in this, in this room who you struggle to have healthy relationships with a spouse or with your friends and coworkers. And, you, and it's because you haven't dealt with some of the stuff that's been suppressed down deep. And so we got we to gotta learn to, to find a healthy way to do that. And we'll come back to this one. Number four, number four, God created the church to help with this. That's what you got to understand. This is what the church is for, okay, is, is to help with these things. And it's, it blows me away at how many churches don't really do this and don't really try to do this. I think our church does a decent job, but we still have people that wear masks. Every, like today, I bet you there's so many people walked in today with their mask on and, hey, how are you doing? And, and you've had the worst week you've ever had and you're falling apart at the seams and your marriage is on the rocks, but you came in today and you're like, everything's fine. And if, that's, if, if you keep doing that, you're never gonna find healing that way. So our church has got to find a way to help with that and it's by getting honest and that's why I'm talking about this today. I actually have this video I want to show you about church. And uh, let's watch this, and then I'll, I'll come back and we'll finish it. What is church? It's a group of people with the same belief. It's a community after God's own heart. All of these people giving love, showing love to one another. But too often in church, we see the word fake. Too often we see people hiding, hiding their hurt hiding their questions, hiding their struggles. 
too often we come to church, put on a mask, and then go back home with our same pain and uncertainties. Why aren't we allowed to be honest? Why can't we be true with one another? Why can't we have questions about faith? Everyone has questions, and if everyone does, that means the person next to you right now has doubts. That means pastors have doubts. But we don't ask these questions. We go on living with our mask, hiding our questions even to ourselves. Why don't we question? Let's recreate the word church. Let's make it a place where people can come, broken down, sad, hurting, and questioning. Let's be honest, truthful, ask questions. God desires you to seek after Him. God wants to be pursued, so beg for His attention and His truth. It's time for a change, but it takes each and every one to open up, be honest, and be loving. As a community, as a family, reach out to each other and ask for support as you grow in your relationship with Christ. Become a community where doubts are welcomed and pain is received. It's time to change. Change from a church where we see fake to a church that is all about honesty and desperately seeking the truth. So let me make a plug uh, in thinking about that uh, for our life groups. Okay, and I know I talk about this all the time. Jared, I put Jared in charge of our life groups for this semester, and he's done a good job recruiting people. But we still have, uh, as far as everyone that comes to our church, just a small fraction of that that are involved in, in life groups. Now, let me explain to you why life groups are really important. Because we talk about in terms of rows and in circles. Because right now, right now what is happening is I'm lecturing you for about 40 minutes. Right, and hopefully you're learning something. But there's really no interaction, right? Because if you raise your hand and try to ask a question, uh, our security team is going to taser you and escort you. I'm just kidding. We're not going to do that. But this is not the forum for that. This is a forum where I get up and shout at you for 40 minutes. But and like like I said, but but what what is going to happen starting tomorrow is our life groups are going to meet. And Jared was in the first service, and Jared took notes. And so we have a list of questions that, and I'm involved in the life group too. And so we're going to ask questions based on the sermon, and we're going to break it down and process it together. And that's when great things really happen. Where, because you know, what, you know what can happen is you're able to ask a question. You're like, hey, there's something I didn't understand. Or can you explain to me uh, you know, uh, this about God? And you open up the scriptures together, and you process through these things together. That's when real healing happens. Very few of that happens in a setting like this. It happens in circles. And then the other thing that happens is my favorite thing, my, my, the highlight of my week is to go to recovery group on Monday night. Now, I've been sober off of drugs and alcohol for 23 years. So I'm not white knuckling it today. I'm not, there, like, there's a small chance that I'm going to drink today or get high today. Like even when I get stressed out, I'm not white knuckling it just because it's been so long and I'm, I'm, I have accountability and all that. But I have other crap that I deal with, okay, on a daily basis. I have stress. I have people that stress me out. I have kids and I'm married and, 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 I, and I'm still a sinner. And so I struggle with stuff. And even after all these years, 23 years later, the highlight of my week is to go in that room next door and sit around in a group with some of the people that are in this room, and we talk about how, how our week was. You know why? Because I need that. I need to be able to talk to people about how I'm, you know, if I'm having a great week, I want to share that. And the Bible says, rejoice with those that rejoice and weep with those that weep. Almost every week, someone in that group breaks down and just goes, I'm, I've had the worst week I've ever had. And we go and, and we rally around them and we pray with them and we build them up. And healing takes place in that. That everyone, I'm just telling you, everyone in this room needs that. I'm not saying you have to come to recovery group, but almost everyone in this room is recovering from something. So you need to find some group where you sit around in circles and you talk about what's really going on. Not the, hey, I'm doing fine. No, no. How about, I'm not doing fine. I'm struggling right now. Like I'm hanging by a thread right now. And I need to tell somebody because if you don't tell somebody, you are going to go do something stupid. That's how that happens. And so if you can talk through it, we're able to talk people off the ledge. And I'm just telling you, everybody needs that. So let me give you the fifth thing, and, and it's this. It's let God heal your broken heart. 
I want you to understand, I can't fix you. No one in this room can fix you. Only God can fix you, and God can fix you. But I, the reason I worded it that way is because God won't force himself on you. God can and will fix you, but you have to ask him, and you have to work with him. And, and I, I, I to, I've said this before. I don't know if I said it in this service, but I, I, think it, I think it was the first service. I always get confused about those. But listen, uh, here, here's what I want you to understand how healing works. I, you can't come up here right now and me just lay hands on you, you know, with the trauma from your childhood. I mean, you could come up and I will pray with you and there might be some great healing that takes place. But, but if you think, like if that little girl that wrote that letter came up right now and says, will you pray for me? And I pray for her and, and like she's never going to have a problem ever again. That's not how it works because here's how it works. We deal with stuff and we might find some closure and some real healing because I've done that. But what I found is that thing that, that I dealt with year, years ago popped its ugly head up at the most inopportune time. I'm like, I already dealt with that. Why am I dealing with it again? So I have to go back and I have to deal with it again. That's, we, so you might have to continually deal with some of these things. You're not, you're not just going to pray a prayer and everything's fixed. You know, salvation happens like that. Salvation happens in an instant, but the process, everything else is a process of growing in Christ and dealing with the pain in our life. It's a process. And let me show you in the Bible how this, how this works, okay? We're in Ezekiel chapter 36. Um, I'll give you the context for this because context is always important. So the children of Israel had left God at this time. The children of Israel during Ezekiel's time, they were off worshiping other idols. They had given God the middle finger. They were like, we don't want you to be our God. And so God never gave up on them. That's the amazing thing about God. And, and so God tells them in the, the chapter, the, uh, the passage previous to this, and he says, he goes, now listen, coming pretty soon is going to come a day when the nation of Israel is going to return to me. And, and you're welcome to do that. And he says, now when that happens, here's what I'm going to do for you. And this is where we pick it up in verse 25. He says, then I will sprinkle you with clean, I, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. Your filth will be washed away and you will no longer worship idols. And I will give you a new heart and I will put a new spirit in you. And I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. And I will put my spirit in you so that you will follow my decrees and be careful to obey my regulations. So this is what God does for us too. He did that for the children of Israel, and he says he'll do that for us too. He says, if you come to me, I will take out your stony, stubborn heart. And guys, come on. Some of you guys have a stony heart. You have a stubborn heart. You're rebellious by nature. We all are. But, but some of you guys, you fight against God. And God goes, if you would just stop and surrender and let me take over, he goes, I will take out your stony, stubborn heart, and I will replace it with a tender, responsive heart. You, you need a new heart is what you need. You need a heart transplant. That's what we need. We don't need to try harder. We don't need self-help books. We need God in our life. That's what we need. So let me get as practical as I know how. If you're taking notes, I want you to write these down. And uh, I, I, this is just homework for you guys, okay? I want to give you some practical tips on if you're struggling, if you're dealing with the pain or trauma in your life, number one, the first thing I want you to do is I want you to spend time this week with God. I want you to carve out some time this week, and I want you to spend some time in prayer with God. And I, I want you to put it on the calendar, and I want, you to, I want you to grab a Bible and carve out some time, like maybe 30 minutes or an hour, and go in your prayer closet and just spend time with God. And, and if, you have, if your heart is broken and you're struggling with stuff, tell him that. If you're mad at God because he took someone out of your life, tell him that. He's a big God. He, he already knows your thoughts. And so just get it out. Just say, hey, I'm really struggling. And just talk, have an honest conversation with God. It's, it's really powerful. The next thing that, some, you know, this may not be for everybody, but write out your feelings. Like write a letter or keep a journal and just, just write out everything how you're feeling to, to God. And sometimes just putting it on paper, there's power there. And then here's the other thing. Here's another thing is you need to talk to another person, okay? It, it's one thing to talk to God, and it's another thing to write it out in a journal, but it's another thing to find somebody. Now, let me... Let me give you a caution on this. You need to find somebody 
It just needs to be one person, and it needs to be a person that you trust, and it needs to be a person that can keep a secret, right? It needs to be someone who loves you and cares about you, and you just sit down, take them out for coffee this week or, or sometime, and just say, hey, can I, can I just tell you how I'm really feeling? And, and just pour it out. And, and if, if they love and care about you, they, they're not going to judge you. What they're going to do is they're going to hug you, and they're going to pray with you, and, and we need that. You, you need to be able to tell someone that. Um, and then the last one is this, is you need to consider some biblical counseling. And, and so I have resources for you. Now, here's what our church is prepared to do, okay, because we, we talked about this this week. So in our church, we have um, three or four people who are, um, s- some are going to school for cou- biblical counseling, and, and some have already been trained in counseling. Now, we're not certified, so that's what I, w- I want you to understand. So if you come to me this week, and if, if you want to do that, what you do is the card in front of you, the next step card, I want you to fill that out and just put on there your name and your number and, and then write on there that I want to talk to someone about counseling. And we'll contact you this week, and we'll set up a time where you can come in, and it, it'll be either be with me or Pastor Chuck or one of the other people that are trained in counseling. Now, again, we're not certified, so there's only so much we can do legally. Uh, and, and so if I talk to you or one of the others sit down and talk with you, and we determine that you need long-term counseling, I will refer you to a couple people that I know that are really good biblical counselors, and, and, and that's probably what you need, okay, if, if you're really struggling. And it'll, it'll help you. Um, you got to you got to quit kicking the can down the road, though, right? What what do we always say? The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and again, expecting different results. So you're you're not going to get better by white knuckling it or just hoping it'll get better. So.